Hello. Oh God, this is super loud. I totally don't even need this except for the people who are going to be uh, watching the live stream. Because if it was just you know us in the room, then I wouldn't need this at all. Because my goodness, this is loud. But you know what? It's all good though. It is good. Oh, Easter Bunny. Hi. <laughs> just a little bit. Anyway, so you see how far this is away from my, my face and it's still really picky? Oh my God. Anyway, I'm just going to go ahead and you know, just pretend this. I'm so sorry. So anyway, so thank you all for coming out to the Katie Lyons Feldman Foundation's 10th uh, meeting of the fiscal year. Uh, my name is David Green. I am the president and the communications director. Uh, the Katie Lions Club, as everyone in this room knows, and I'm sure 90% uh, of the 25,000 followers who are going to be uh, watching this over the next couple of weeks are aware because they hear me drone on every month. The Katie Lions are an all-volunteer service organization started in 1972 as the local chapter of the largest service organization in the world. And I have a Rotarian in the audience, so don't disagree with me. Um, so the Katie Lions Club, we do, uh, you know, we, are, we, we work on the five pillars of lionism. Uh, we work on the environment. Uh, with that, we have a community garden. We work on uh, childhood cancer through our toy drive every year. We work on diabetes through our sponsorship of children to go to the Texas Lions Camp in Kerrville at no cost to them or their families. Um, we work on hunger initiatives through our work with the food pantries and food banks here in the community. And what am I forgetting? What am I forgetting? Oh, right, I'm forgetting vision because glasses. Uh, this is the biggest one for us, right? We have over 50 eyeglass collection boxes throughout the Katy community. We also offer a VSP Eyes of Hope for a local distributor. So what that means is if you're a low-income uh, person, um, you can get a pair of glasses at no cost to you. Um, actually, one of our guest speakers tonight, Jay Danella, he's actually going to, um, you know, his Christ Clinic actually is one of our local community partners. So if you are a low-income person and you need help getting glasses, you can reach out to Christ Clinic, ask for Jay Danella, or whoever he tells you to ask for, and you can get a pair of glasses if you qualify, again, at no cost to you, no cost to your family. Um, with that, I just want to quickly introduce my team. I know it's you know really super, super lovely out. It's it's rainy. It's it's nasty out. It's gray. It's it's wet. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of people come out tonight. Um, first, I want to you know I would like to introduce my vice president Lydia Osuna. She's not here. She actually was picking up her granddaughter from the uh, from the airport today. So you know my prayers go out to her as she drives home from this. Uh, then we have my treasurer Sue Green. Sue, stand up with those bunny ears. She was the Easter Bunny for years. Um, at three different churches, she was the, the Easter Bunny in charge. The head bunny in charge, that's what it is. Um, she has not been roped into that this year. Um, and and uh, <laughs> I say that as we're in church. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and then Maddie Thickpen is our secretary. Maddie, stand up for the lovely people. Um, and yes, we love you, Maddie. Uh, and then, you can sit back down, no, it's okay. I, I won't keep embarrassing you. And then she was supposed to be on our board of directors, but through machinations that I had no control over, Carol Barnett, who was supposed to be our immediate past president, is not officially our immediate past president, even though, let's be honest, she is. Um, so she's in the gray hoodie over there. Um, anyway, we had a few new members that, that joined last month. Um, because they're not here, I'm not going to induct them tonight. Um, it's gonna be a really quick meeting. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and instead turn it over to, hey, we're actually running on time, and I love that so much. Uh, Susan, if you want to come up. Susan is from the Katie ISD Fine Arts. She's the assistant director. She's going to be our first speaker. She's going to talk for about 15, 20 minutes, maybe a little bit longer if you want. Um, and that right there is the uh, camera if you want to look at it. You know, I, I'll be honest, I'm aiming for the W in the back. So whatever that works for you, here's your mic. You can have this one, you can have that one. You would think, right? Yeah, that works. Do you want to stand? Because I can get you one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so um, my name is Susan Chabrowski. I'm with the um, KDISD. I'm one of the assistant directors of fine arts for the district. Um, I get to serve as a leader and an advocate. Um, my areas, my disciplines that I oversee include K through 12 visual art, actually pre-K through 12 visual art now, uh, choir and theater. Um, 
I have a lot on my plate, um, but uh, it's such worthwhile work, and I work with the world's greatest teachers, and um, we've got a lot of great systems in place, and so it's a really great job. Um, KDISD, in case you're curious, has currently about 90,000 students in the district, which is insane to me. Uh, we have 44 elementary campuses with 45 and 46 going up next year. Um, we have 17 junior highs and nine high schools currently with a 10th on its way. Um, the staff that I work with, I have 72 elementary art teachers. I have 71 secondary art teachers. I have 43 choir directors and 42 theater directors. It's a lot of folks and like I said, they're just, they're great to work with. Um, fine arts wise, 100% of our elementary students uh, get to go to art and music classes. Um, our aim is once a week. Sometimes it's a little more, sometimes it's like once every six or seven days. Our goal is once a week for art and music. They all get to go to a separate art class and a separate music class. And then um, about 65% of our secondary students are um, actively engaged in fine arts courses at the junior highs and high schools, which is a really good number. Um, people often ask me, so fine arts administrator, what does that mean? What does your day-to-day -day look like? And I tell them, like, there's no normal. Every day is completely different. <laughs> uh, for instance, last week, let's see, last week I served as a contest manager for a junior high one-act play festival. Uh, I went to some choir UIL performances. Uh, we are setting up for our spring art show that happens next week. I met with a principal and a teacher to work on an improvement plan. I mean, every day is just so different. That's actually one of the things that I love most about my job is it's not the same day in and day out. Um, my primary job is to make sure that teachers have what they need, the resources that they need, the, um, the support that they need to teach their kids, to have successful programs, um, to have programs that kids want to be involved in because we know that kids that are in the arts and actively engaged in arts, um, they have better uh, test scores, their attendance is up, uh, their behavior is better, it's just better all the way around. So um, we, we take fine arts very seriously in KDISD and I'm really grateful to be a part of it. Um, the thing that drives me in my work every day is the belief that every single student deserves quality arts education. So that's my goal every day when I go to work is to make sure that teachers have what they need. Um, and uh, I really think that students need the arts for, there's three big reasons. The first one is the arts just make us better humans, right? Um, simply put, the arts are an integral part of being human regardless of our financial status, ethnicity, or political stance. Setting the arts creates opportunities to develop creativity and imagination and to experience joy, beauty, and to cultivate a sense of wonder, which is one of my favorite things about life is seeing something and just kind of being in awe of it. Um, in education, we spend a lot of time trying to develop skills in students that are gonna help them be successful as adults, no matter what they're doing. Um, we call them 21st century skills. Um, some people will say those are soft skills. I say they're just life skills that we all need, such as, I'm gonna read them because it's a long list and this, there's more to it than this. Collaboration, effective communication, self-expression, creativity, organization, problem solving, self-direction, empathy, social responsibility. These are things that kids get when they are engaged in the arts. Um, their teachers work closely with them to create a play or to create a piece of art or to make um, music together. Um, all of those skills are super important and they are practiced day in and day out and kids leave fine arts programs with those skills under their belt. Um, second, students need the arts just for the sake of art. Um, if we want to continue having great art and culture in the world, we have to give students the skills to create great art. I've often found myself saying things like, you know, we just want kids to love the arts. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily care if they grow up to be an art teacher or an artist themselves. I just want them to love art. I've rethought that because we actually do need to teach kids to go into the arts professions, right? Um, because if they don't, then art ceases to exist. And I thought about um, how our career in tech ed teachers they may be teaching plumbing or auto mechanics, and they're not out to just teach kids to love plumbing and mechanics. 
uh, or mechanical things, they're teaching them how to be a plumber and how to be a mechanic. And, and they're cranking out those certifications. So, you know, I like to remind teachers, yes, we absolutely want all of our students to love the arts for the rest of their life. But some of them, we want them to go on and pursue the arts. Um, here's a couple of fun facts. Um, as I was kind of looking into this whole thing of creativity and, and how it um, affects our world. Did you know that today over 5 million Americans are employed in arts and culture related industries? 5 million, that's a lot. Did you know that the arts con uh, contribution to the GDP is greater than agriculture and transportation? The arts make a significant impact on our economy and there are viable lucrative jobs in the arts. Students need training so they can pr pursue those jobs in the arts. And third, students just need access to the arts uh, for the sake of support in the rest of their life and other content areas, disciplines. We do this through arts integration, where the arts are used as a tool to teach other contents like math, language arts, science, and social studies. You think about the alphabet song that we all learned probably in pre-K, A, B, C, D, E, right? And it's how we learned it as a child through a song. Arts integration weaves together the arts and standard curricula to create richer, more lasting learning experiences. Research is consistently showing that in schools where arts integration is being used, students' achievement uh, has soared, attendance rates have improved, and discipline referrals have dropped. Arts integration makes learning fun. Um, I had a, a chance to talk to a student of mine, a previous student of mine from many years ago. His name's Gabriel Walker, and he was a member of my varsity choir. I used to teach choir back before I became, you know, crossed over to the dark side of administration. <laughs> um, I absolutely loved being a high school choir director, and Gabriel was one of those standout kids who, I think when he was four or five, he knew that he wanted to sing for the rest of his life. Uh, when he came to me as a high school kid, uh, he almost knew more repertoire than I knew. I mean, he would come into my office almost daily. Have you heard this song? Have you heard this? And I'd be like, Gabriel, stop. You're smarter than me. Um, and anyway, Gabriel uh, recently completed his master's degree in opera and German. He's kind of smart. Um, I'm really proud of him. But I asked him what arts education meant to him, and the words that he used were these. Arts education was a safe haven for me. It meant having the freedom to fully express myself in ways I otherwise didn't know how. And I think about Gabriel, and he was kind of a shy kid, you know, super smart, but kind of quiet, and could be really goofy and fun, and he really came into, his, into himself when he was in the choir room, um, achieved a lot, and worked really hard. Um, I learned probably as much from him as he did from me probably learned more from him. <laughs> um, but it was really, I, I thought how neat it was that he took it to such a personal level to talk about what arts meant to him. It wasn't just about learning the technique of how to be a good singer or learning about choral repertoire. It was about how it affected him as a human. All students need access to arts um, for the sake of humanity, for the sake of the arts, and for the sake of learning in general. Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft, said, we have only begun to invent what will be possible. Science has opened the door, but artistry and imagination will take us through it. These days it's STEAM, not STEM. Um, they've added the A, and that is arts. That's exciting. We have to make sure we're doing everything we can to give all students equitable access to develop that artistry and imagination through quality arts education. With that in mind, um, we're uh, KDISD is grateful again to partner with Katie Lyons Club for the International Peace Poster Contest, again for the 23-24 school year. This contest gives our students a beautiful opportunity to express their ideas and visions of peace. It inspires our students to think creatively about the world they live in and what they can do to contribute to peace globally. We're looking forward to seeing the entries our students submit for the 23-24 Peace Poster Dare to Dream Contest. Um, and then I would like to also just kind of put in a shameless plug. If you're looking for great arts um, access, you want to go see a show, go see a choir concert or a band concert or a theater production, 
You don't have to drive all the way downtown. You can come to any of your local junior highs, high schools, even the elementary campuses. Um, if you are interested, you can check out the Fine Arts website on the KDISD, you know, you can find us on the KDISD homepage. Uh, we keep our calendar as up to date as possible, so if you're interested in any of those shows, you can find that information there. And we invite you to come, come visit and come uh, see our students in action. Uh, we've got some really great programs, um, some exceptional performances that, you know, you just will be amazed. I have sat through some plays and musicals that I thought, am I at the Alley Theater? Because this is amazing. These kids are not your average kids. They're just, they, they will blow your mind. Um, and also, we have our annual spring art show is next week, Wednesday, from 5.30 to 7.30 at the Leonard Merrill Center Arena, and it's free, so you're welcome to come by. We'll have the arena floor will be packed with 2D and 3D art from pre-K all the way up to 12th grade students, so we'd love to see you there. That's it. Do y'all have any questions for me? Does, does the program emphasize much about how to make a living in art? Because I know that's, art is almost viewed as a hobby. Yes. And it is critical and very important, but sure. it doesn't seem like, at least when I was in school, it was never taught as, you know, this is how you paint, but this isn't, you know, you're on your own if you're trying to make a living at it. Right. Do you ever emphasize any of that? Yes, and that is uh, in the TEKS now. Um, teachers are sharing with their students the job opportunities. I know that when I was a high school choir director, I would take, um, I had a unit, and I would kind of spread it out over time, but we would talk about all the possibilities for students, because like for theater, for example, you know, so many people just think, oh, I don't want to be an actor, so I don't want to be in theater. Okay, but that's just one small piece of it. There's the whole technical behind the scenes thing. You can, you can work, um, you know, in ticket sales. You could work in marketing. You could be a part of the, you know, the lighting sound crew. You could be building sets. Um, and so, yeah, we do, we do try to emphasize that. And we have quite a few students that go into um, majors in fine arts so that they can pursue those avenues? That's a good question. So uh, one of the things that we actually, as a, as a club did, um, was last month we actually um, sponsored uh, the, vag the Vagina Monologues, yeah. which of course is a feminist um, ent sure. entry. Um, is that something, I mean, so, so obviously not necessarily that one, but potentially, uh, but is there an opportunity for, uh, let's say the Katie Lyons Club, let's say we wanted to uh, do another play in the summer, right? Mm -hmm. Would we be able to, I, I don't know, um, uh, requisition, uh, check out as if they were library books, uh, some actors from the school system? Is that something that exists? Or is there a partnership that we can uh, have with the school system to make? I would know? really be, I don't know, I, I, there's nothing in place. Um, but I would be open to a discussion about it um, because we could always, you know, kind of put an put an all call out to teachers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of them will have students that are interested in summer work or summer, you know, volunteer even, um, but opportunities to continue working their craft during the summer. Yeah, I'd be open to that discussion. Yes, you do. I want to capture it on the recording. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Katie has several actors and actresses and uh, several writers sure. that are Katie people. Mm -hmm. uh, Renee Zellweger is one of them. Yes. She doesn't claim us, but we claim her. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard she's moving back to Katie. Is that true? That's what I hear. I read that just the other day. Let's hope and that we can maybe recruit her as a new member. <laughs> Good luck. I'll see you. <laughs> um, so another question I had was, um, so you know we do the eyeglass collection boxes, and we order them through international, and we're spending what treasurer ten, fifteen dollars a box, something like that. Anyway, <clears throat> about eight dollars, ten dollars, right? So my question is this, right? Um, would there be an opportunity if we provided you? boxes of the school system, could we convince the students to 
paint them for us so we could have more unique boxes to collect? Mm. We could definitely talk about that. Yeah. yeah. It, the, the trick to that is just the timing because right. teachers have so many contests on their plate and the, if I knew about it right, really like in the next month or so that I, so that I can add it to their, kind of to their calendar of events that they've got that they will have for the next school year, they can plan for it. Um, and, you know, yeah, if you have a certain amount of boxes, then I'd be really happy to help, you know, help yeah. make that happen. And at the end of the school, that would be a good project. Yeah. Um, how can the community or how can, uh, how can the wider Katy community, how can we uh, be more supportive of the fine arts uh, department and uh, kids who are pursuing fine arts as something that they want to potentially make a career out of? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think coming to events, you know, showing yeah. support that way. Um, I know a lot of the groups, uh, especially the secondary groups, they have boosters, so parents and community can get involved to, you know, help build sets and like marching bands, you'll see a huge group of folks that are pushing all of their equipment out onto the field. I mean, there's always a need for help, um, especially with those secondary programs. And I'm thinking specifically band, choir, orchestra, and theater. Um, the theater is wonderful. Yes, yeah. Their plays are fantastic. Yes, they really are. In fact, um, Seven Lakes uh, High School, um, they just qualified for the next round mm -hmm. of uh, UIL OAP, which is region, which I think is one away from state. So we've not had a group go that high in quite a while. We're really excited about this. Um, but they also, they did a musical earlier in the year and what they did is escaping me, but um, they were nominated for every single Tommy Tune Award that there is, mm -hmm. and, which is huge. I'm like, that just doesn't happen. So, yeah, it's incredible. Well, all right, I think I have asked, got on all my questions asked and answered at this point. Maddie, Carol, Daniel, no? Oh, the, the Spring Art Show? Yes. Yes. It's going to be at the Merrill Center um, oh, okay. at the arena, and it's Wednesday, 5.30 to 7.30. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. So um, we are running a little ahead of schedule, which I like, because especially when there's not that many people in the audience, questions don't – actually, we had more questions than we normally do, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> I, I think this space is inspiring – us to ask questions. We might have to have a conversation with our um, uh, hosts about whether or not we can just relocate here permanently. Uh, no promises, no promises. It's, it's, it's something I'm threatening. Anyway, um, Carol, so I volunteer you as our next speaker. So Carol Barnett is, the, is a zone chair for District 2S2. She has been a lion for eight, nine years. She's really resistant to coming up here. So I guess it's not happening. You're not going to come up here and talk about your journey of service? I really do. I only need five minutes of your life this time. I'll need more next time. No, I want you to run down of what led, why did you become a lion? What led you to become a lion? Why do you like to serve our, your community? You know, the usual. Thank you. I was going to go down and have a dance career, but then I decided that wasn't for me in my older age, so I decided to do service work instead. No, actually, my husband passed away 10 years ago, 12 years ago, so I decided it was time to fill my life with something to help other people, so that began my journey. I started working at the volunteering at the service center in Katy, and met a gentleman, Jim Phillips, there, who had been a lion for 30 some odd years. So he said to me one time, why don't I come down to the Lions Club and see what it's all about? I had never even heard of the Lions Club other than to see people collecting money in the middle of the street. 
So I went with Jim and went to a few meetings and thus began my journey. Started off with just sitting and observing for a year and getting involved in service. Then I became the secretary, did that for a while. Then I moved up to vice president and president became familiar with the PNS group, which is our district meeting, and started going to meetings there. So I've kind of held every organization role there is. Uh, I just completed master's degree for the Lyons University also, working on my PhD, so. But I just enjoy helping other people uh, in whatever need, vision in particular, I think it's wonderful what, what the lions do with vision for the children. It's just spectacular. So any anybody who needs any help, well, I'm kind of out there and I'm glad to help. So that's my journey. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions? No? Thank you much. Of course I wanted that, of course, of course. Um, so that was 100% exactly what I was looking for. Um, I just want to really quickly, uh, because again, like I said, we're running a little ahead of schedule, and I love that we're ahead of schedule. Um, I want to plug in a couple of events coming up. Um, so on April 15th, uh, from 9 a.m. until uh, noon, so that's going to be a Saturday, April 15th. If you come out to uh, Katie's First Baptist Church, that's uh, 600 Pin Oak, Road uh, in Old Katy, right off the highway, I-10. Uh, there's going to be a, a recycling day. Um, so whether that's your used classes, whether you need to shred some papers, uh, whether you've got an old tube TV. Um, if you visit our website, www.katylions.org, you can actually get the list of all the things that will be accepted at this. It's the uh, Don't Mess With Texas Trash Off Day. Um, we, the Katie Lions, we always partner with the City of Katy and Keep Katy Beautiful every year. Um, so we do it twice a year. We do it here in the spring and then we do it again in the fall. Uh, so this is the spring one and we are really excited that we're going to be doing that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, then May 4th, so that's next month, um, that's going to be our next uh, guest speaker, uh, our next community night. So on May 4th, um, we're going to have uh, Cam Campbell, that's Coach Cam. Uh, he's worked with the Houston Texans and plenty of other organizations. He's a um, professional speaker. He also uh, teaches on, on how to be an equitable organization, how to be a diversely supportive organization. Um, and then we're gonna have Prevent Blindness Texas also coming out. Prevent Blindness Texas offers dozens of programs all over the state at no to low cost to people. Um, they actually did, did two trainings for us, one in January, one last month in March. Um, to teach our Lions and our, our community leaders how to be uh, certified vision screeners to go into the school system now and actually screen children and work with the nurses in the school system. Um, we're actually going to be working with um, several local um, daycares as well to provide screening opportunities for them, especially the kids who are gonna be going into KDISD. We wanna make sure we take some of that burden off the nurses who, as we all know, especially after COVID and everything, they're just being inundated with that. I mean, I just sent out six vouchers today for our VSP Eyes of Hope program, and that's just one day. We've, we've done, I wanna say 50 or 60 just in the last two months. These are kids in the KDISD system who literally need a pair of glasses and they have no financial support for that. The school system has no way to support them. We, the Katie Lions, we step up and we take care of that. Um, then on June 1st, we're gonna have our other community night. Um, we're going to have Adrian Divitz from the uh, Katie Harris Society and Amanda Rose from FCC Katie, who are gonna be our guest speakers that night. Um, and then on June 15th, we're going to have, um, that's our annual meeting. Now we like our annual meetings to be open to the public because we are here to serve, which means we wanna have you all come out to that. Uh, we're gonna have a magic show, so it literally, we're not gonna just have a boring you know, meeting that nobody, oh my God, it's just tons of, of talking and I'm done, I'm over it. So we're gonna have a magic show, one hour magic show. Um, the tickets are gonna be $10 for adults, $5 for teens, and if you're, I believe it's four under, but don't quote me on that, 
it'll be free. Um, so there's that. There's plenty of other events happening in the life of our organization. Uh, just visit us on the web, www.katielyons.org. And if you are not getting our weekly email blast, send an email to hello at katielyons.org. Ask to be put on that email blast. It goes out pretty much every week. Occasionally, we'll skip a week. Uh, but for the most part, it goes out every single week on Wednesdays. Um, and with that, I'm going to ask Jay Danella from Christ Clinic in Katy to come up, talk about this amazing organization uh, who we're working with now and we want more involvement with. Jay. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, perfect timing to be speaking in a church this week, you know, from, from Christ Clinic. Um, it, it is an honor to, to be in front of uh, the Lions Club. I've, I have been in Rotary for about 35 years. Um, but right when I was trying to decide whether it was Rotary, I was also getting recruited by the Lions Club in the Galleria. And my CPA at the time was in Rotary, and he, he was the one that pushed me over the edge. So I have nothing but fond uh, appreciation for the Lions Club. Uh, as a matter of fact, my, one of my daughters, I have three daughters, and my middle daughter, uh, she used to be over um, marketing and donor relations for the, the Lions Camp out in Kerrville. That you mentioned already so uh, I love that camp I love my, my oldest daughter she's a doctor doing cancer research my middle daughter she's a, got a consultant with kids with cancer and my youngest daughter she just graduated from A&M and she's actually doing marketing communications for a company up in College Station so very proud of my daughters and that's really why I'm with Christ Clinic right now because when the youngest one graduated from, from college I felt like I had this freedom in my life to, to finally do something different. Um, I don't know how much or how involved some of you have ever gotten in the healthcare delivery system of our great country, but it's a mess. I mean, and that's the most polite way I can put it. Um, I actually went to Baylor because I wanted to be a doctor, but I was paying my own way and it was just gonna be a very long, expensive trip. So. I flipped my major to a healthcare business degree and I've been in healthcare ever since. So I've been in healthcare almost 40 years, um, but it's always been on the corporate consulting side. And initially, I felt like I could actually make a difference. Uh, I felt like I could get creative and help employers do different things with their benefit programs and you know, save, actually save money. But over the years, it really evolved into what I not so lovingly call the cartel. Um, you know, it's down to Aetna, Blue Cross, Cigna, and United Healthcare. The BUCAs is, is the acronym that everybody calls it in the industry. But, you know, if you're not doing what Aetna says or what Blue Cross says, they're not gonna allow it. Um, so, so physicians and healthcare providers are not being able to pr practice healthcare. Um, the hospitals are buying up a lot of medical practitioner programs, you know, and offices, independent physicians are, are, a lot of them are flipping their practice to what's called concierge care, or you may have heard direct primary care now, uh, where, you know, people can, can pay, you know, like an annual fee to have access to this doctor whenever they want to. But, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's really hurting the people that don't have money and, and cannot access the healthcare system. Um, the story I like using uh, why I am where I am today is if you use your imagination and you pretend uh, that there is this owner of a tr long haul trucking company and he wants to be like a really good guy to all of his truckers. So he promises them all, here's a little plastic card that when you're out driving, you can go wherever you want to and dinner's on me. The, the, just show him the card and all you gotta do is pay $10. If you, if you start thinking about it, what, what are the truckers going to do? They're, are they going to go to the McDonald's for $10 or a steak place? If it's only going to cost them $10, what do they care? So the, the, the immediate direction that most of them would be going would be to the steak places. Then the steak places, they start figuring out that these truck drivers, they don't care if that steak costs $30 or if the steak costs $300 because they're only paying $10 of it. That is pretty much exactly what has evolved in our healthcare delivery system. You know, people just are not aware of how much things cost, so the, so the healthcare practitioners have been just jacking it up. The insurance companies don't really care 
how much things cost. They, they claim that they're get, getting involved in claim management, but you know, in reality, if the claims keep going up, they're just passing those claims on in higher premiums to the people that are having the insurance. And then, you know, ultimately the employer is paying the bill. And then the employer, you know, out of necessity because, it, you know, they have to make a, make a living themselves, they're passing, they're either decreasing the benefits to their employees uh, with like higher deductibles, higher co-pays, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. Or they're making the contributions that the employees have to pay greater in addition. So, you know, what's going on in the Katy area especially is with all these huge distribution centers, the Amazons, and you, know, I mean, you name it, the rooms to go, they're hiring a lot of part-time people to keep them off of their full-time books so they don't have to provide them any kind of health care benefits, which is kind of terrible for our community because they're hiring lower income people, warehouse workers, for example, who are not making a ton of money, and then they're not providing them any kind of health care. So, all that perfect storm, you know, it's when my daughter, grad, my youngest graduated from college, I wanted to give back to our local community. Um, I've been a healthcare consultant my entire career, but most of my clients and all of my companies that I work for were the very large national, sometimes even international companies. So I was always working in the Galleria or downtown Houston. I've lived in Katy for almost 40 years, I guess, ever since we got married. but. I would see it by the light of day on the weekends. You know, it was like I was, I was getting in my car, driving in at 5 or 5.30 in the morning to try to stay out of some of the traffic, getting home half the time after dark. So I wanted to pull back my, my tentacles, I guess, and, and give back to the Katy marketplace. And I started meeting with a lot of community leaders around Katy and, you know, the mayor's office and Economic Development Council and everybody. And everybody kept saying, well, you know, there's, have you talked to Christ Clinic? They're, they're really doing some interesting stuff, creative stuff, because I was, I was just bitching. I was just like, I want to get out of healthcare. Sorry if I said bitching in church, but anyways, um, <laughs> it, was like, it was just like, you know, I wanted to get out, and, and everybody kept saying, well, but they're doing some really cool stuff. You ought to talk to them. The mayor invited me to a breakfast meeting a couple months ago, and, and I'm shaking hands, introducing myself to people, and sure enough, I meet the executive director of Price Clinic. And it was just, it was almost like, you know, God was telling me, this is what you got to do. I mean, it was just like putting me in front of the right person at the right time. They are doing exactly what I wanted to do. We don't deal with insurance. We don't deal with we're not what's called a federally qualified health center, FQHC, so we don't have to deal with government restrictions and guidelines and all that kind of stuff. So we're very, very flexible. I, I kind of hate admitting this because I've lived in Katy for so long, but before Price Clinic was introduced to me as recently as probably six months ago, I didn't even know they existed. And you know, it's, it's very, very unfortunate because they've been around for 20, 22 years doing great things, but it's, it's this whole different community, whole different population. Um, I was actually talking to a guy at um, the Fort Bend Economic Development Council meeting, and he was a, a really high level executive at a big national company, and so obviously he's making a ton of money. And I, I told him what I was doing and why I was loving what I'm doing with Christ Clinic these days, and, and he's like, I don't think there's anything wrong with our healthcare delivery system. And I was just like, ah, you know, what world are you living in? So it was, it was just very eye-opening, very frustrating. But the fact that we are doing so many great things in our community, local community, and have been for a long time. Uh, last year alone, we saw over 7,000 patients um, for over, for over 15,000 different patient visits. Um, we have moved, we started out in downtown Katy, uh, Old Town Katy, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we are now in a clinic right off of Kingsland Boulevard in Pin Oak, right across from Katy Mills Mall. We've got 14 exam rooms. We can do just about, I mean, we don't do surgeries, obviously, but we actually have on our board of directors, we have Memorial Hermann, we have Methodist. Um, we are doing great things and we can actually bring in specialists for specialty needs whenever we need them. 
Um, we have a, a great list of, long list of volunteer physicians. Um, all of our physicians are volunteers. Uh, we have, we start with like med, medical, mid-level uh, medical practitioners as far as our full-time staff. And they kind of do, you know, fill in the, fill in the blanks when the physicians aren't with the patients. But, um, you know, our, our capacity is huge. The only, the only difference that we have and, and drawback that we have is the fact that we are right at the intersection of Waller County, Harris County, and Fort Bend County. And as any one of you probably know, you know, everybody's pointing their finger, that's not our problem. You know, city of Katy says, oh, well, we're perfect. Or, you know, Fort Bend says, oh, well, we've got Sugar Land, we've got all the, you know, we're perfect. But we actually had a meeting not too long ago with uh, Fort Bend Health and Human Services, and they, they admitted that our area is this huge gap in healthcare, in, in the uninsured and underinsured population of healthcare. Um, obviously, we have the whole medical center too with all the big hospitals and everything, so we have great resources as far as catastrophic care and you know hospital-based care, but the reason they're on our board of directors is because we're taking a lot of the heat off of them because the uninsured population are going to their emergency rooms and saying, I know legally you have to see us, and there's nothing you could know about it, except they have to sit in the waiting room of the emergency room for two or three days until somebody can see them. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, take, we're saving the hospitals a lot of money. They're, they're referring their un-emergency un, uh, type patients to us, and we're referring the patients that are above our capabilities to them. So it's a great relationship. Um, I have been, I've been with Christ Clinic for three months now. So many amazing things are happening. Um, I have stopped saying anything is a coincidence. I really have. I mean, it's, it's like, I don't know if y'all are familiar with the term God winks, but it's um, it just like people keep getting thrown right in my path every time I need something or something needs to happen. Um, I was at a networking function a couple weeks ago, and I have met with most of the like county commissioners and, and a lot of the Texas state representatives. Uh, uh, Glenn Hager, the, the Texas comptroller, he actually helped start Christ Clinic many, many years ago. So, I mean, we, we have these, this great political draw, but I had not really made any inroads in Harris County because it's such a huge animal. I was just like, okay, I got priorities. Trying to, trying to meet with Harris County would be just a major problem. And um, I was at this networking function and this lady comes up to me and she goes, I'm running late for a meeting, but something told me I needed to come over and say hi to you and introduce myself. And she just happened to be the community liaison for region four of Harris County, <laughs> which is our region. It was like, yeah. So, I mean, you know, she's already toured uh, the clinic. One of the things that I love doing is because so few people actually know about the clinic and our capabilities is, is offering tours, you know, at the clinic for people that are decision makers, community leaders, whatever, um, business owners. Um, we have a couple different um, programs that we're, we're doing right now. We, one of the things is because we are right there at that one location, that limits some of the people that can come to see us. But we are, we're making outreach to a lot of different churches in different areas that they might wanna put a temporary, like a satellite clinic in their church. Uh, we've got one up in uh, Prairie View right now that we're working on. We've got one up in College Station. We've got a couple uh, around the city, uh, for example. But you know, depending on where they are, if we put in a, a satellite clinic at the church, they can draw their local, you know, the people that go to their church and they can walk there if they have to instead of having to figure out how to get to, to Christ Clinic and Katy, which is a fantastic thing. Um, the other thing that, that I'm really, really responsible for and really excited about because of my background in the corporate world, uh, we, we have this program called the Employer Sponsored Membership Program. And it's like a gym membership, it really is. It's not insurance because we don't, we don't take insurance, we don't play those games, like I said, but um, the ESM program 
it allows an employer to, to actually say, okay, we have a lot of employees that are not taking the benefits because they can't afford the premiums, that's one thing, or we have a lot of employees that are not full-time, so they're not eligible for, for, for benefits. Um, you know, we're actually talking with KDISD, for example, and I was telling her, um, you know, it's like for their part-time bus drivers and cafeteria workers, they're not working enough hours in the day to qualify for full-time benefits, but they need health care. So it allows an employer to say, we will provide you with this membership to the clinic and it only costs them $40 a month. Uh, and then that employee can go to the clinic whenever they need to for only $5. I mean, it's, we could say it's free, but you know, $5 kind of encourages them to, to keep their appointments, but that's about the only reason we're charging $5. You know, the $40 a month is way, way less expensive than several hundred, if not several thousand dollars in premium for those employees. So, and it's, it's not insurance, so there's not all the guidelines and 75% required participation and you got to contribute, blah, blah, blah. And just, I mean, that's the stuff that I was running away from. We are, we are strictly, it's just like a gym membership. Whoever needs it can, can say to the employer, yeah, that would be really good for me. I mean, we have like cleaning companies and um, home, home health care, home, you know, uh, patient care uh, services where the people that go out and, and the caregivers, they don't have benefits, they don't have insurance, but they need health care. And to be able to access the health care that we're providing, which is way over and above what they would be able to get from a CVS or a Walgreens, it's just so meaningful to the, this population. Um, you know, I've, I've, I don't know, I, I get goosebumps every day because I just love what we're doing, how we're helping people. You know, when I, when I was introduced to David in the, in the Lions Club, I knew about the, the, the glass, eyeglass connection with the Lions. I know that that's always been kind of a, a very focal point, no pun intended. Um, but, you know, it's like, um, we do a lot of testing and a lot of eye care for patients, but we have not been able to help them get glasses. And to be able to partner with the Lions Club and, and give those coupons after we have fixed their eyes and, and you know, our, our success rate in like treating diabetes and cholesterol and smoking cessation, we have a lot of educational classes, is higher than, than most and almost all state and national levels of results. So, uh, and most of that I attribute is because these people don't have anywhere else to turn. We become their medical home. We become the people that they trust. It's not like going to a regular doctor's office where you get to see the doctor for five minutes and you forget exactly everything that he said as soon as he walks out because, you know, his time is so limited and he has to see a thousand patients a day. You know, we we actually will take our time with our patients and, and get them to where they need to be. Um, we, we are partnering with the, the uh, University of Houston system. We're doing a lot of data analysis for like social determinants of health because especially in the lower income populations, they, we might be able to fix their health problem, but we're not gonna be able to help them with their social problems. You know, they, they may not have Housing. They may not be able to pay their bills. They may not have uh, good food for their families. So, so be, being involved in a partnership with the, the University of Houston for data analytics, I mean, is critical because we're really doing much more than just healthcare delivery. Um, I've been talking pretty fast and pretty uh, quick. I hope I didn't miss too much, but you know, I wanted to leave a couple minutes for any questions or anything, if anybody has any problems or questions, I'd be happy to. Well, my other question is, what are the hours of Vice Coast? Uh, Monday through Thursday, uh, we're open 9 to 5, and then Friday, 9 to 3. So we do shut down a little bit early on Friday. And what is your typical wait time for someone coming in for that's, that's a really good point because we usually try to keep about half of our capacity per day open for walk-ins. Um, we, we encourage and, and advise to, to actually set your appointments in advance if, whenever possible. But we do 
we know that people can't get sick on schedule. So, I mean, it's like, you know, we, we try to keep a, a available quantity of appointment time open for walk-ins. So usually they, they see them almost immediately. And our typical, what's called cycle time, the, the time from a person coming in versus the time they leave is about an hour, which it's very, you know, time. It's better in the emergency room, and I don't know about you, but it's usually better than my doctor visits that I've seen in the past. I mean, yeah. you sit in the damn waiting room for half an hour or something. I thought my appointment was an hour ago. Yes, I would like to know what type of feed, if any, you charge to walk in. That's a great question. Um, we have um, two different tiers of fees. Um, the walk-ins, if they don't want to prove their their low income status, um, then it's just fifty dollars, and, and that's just you know it's just no questions asked. You know we don't like I said we don't take insurance. We don't ask them. We don't even ask them if they're U.S. citizens because we have a lot of Spanish speaking, a lot of immigrants coming in that don't have anywhere to turn. Um, so if if they just need to see a a healthcare provider, it's fifty dollars, and then we also. Our, our pharmacy just got upgraded to a class A pharmacy, so we actually have a full retail pharmacy now on premises, uh, which is being a charity clinic, much less expensive than any other pharmacy that we know of around here, especially. Um, and the any kind of lab work or testing is also incredibly less expensive than any kind of lab work or testing. It's not included in that $50 fee. Um, if they do want to pr prove that they are at 200% of the poverty level or below, then their visit is only $25. But again, and, and then everything else stays the same. And then with the ESM program, if, the, if their employer is funding a membership, that's only $5. So it's like a three-tier structure. How much does it cost the employer if they're funding a membership? That's $40 a month. Per person. Okay. And then is there any like specific qualifications for the employer to qualify to be able to provide that? No, we're not insurance. I mean, it's, it's so simple. I mean, the, the employer contract is like fill out the name of the company, your address and your phone number, uh, and who the contact is going to be in their phone number and email address. The employee, um, application or membership application is, you know, just very basic. Uh, but there, like I said, there's no minimum participation requirements, minimum, you know, how much the employer has to, you know, have as far as everybody being covered or not being covered because it's, just, it's totally up to the employee if they need it or not. And, and in relation to the clinic itself, um, do you guys provide, um, other than just, you know, consultation, are, are you guys having, uh, giving any sort of access to potential emergency room type surgical services or anything like that? To, to what? I'm sorry. Are, are, are there, are there any sort of services that are kind of on the emergency room, like the urgent care level? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, we do a lot of that. Um, but you know, if it's, you know, if they're bleeding or having a heart attack, obviously they have to go to the hospital. But a lot of things that people, especially uninsured people, think is an emergency is not necessarily emergency. And we can handle, you know, having been in the industry for as long as I was, I mean, probably, I would say at least 80% of all healthcare claims, we could handle ourselves at the clinic. You know, it's, we don't do, you don't do fish hooks in the foot, right? We can we can do surgeries at the hospitals, you know, we because of our relationships with the hospitals. But we they will like volunteer operating room time, and they will volunteer anesthesiologists and surgeons, you know, as needed, kind of as a in kind donation to the clinic. You know, since since we are charity, I mean, every all of our operating funds are uh, individual donations, churches, the hospital systems, uh, and employers. I'm sorry, I, I ran along and I, I blew your. I'm I've been pretending it hasn't happened. Of, it's all good. 
Because I did the uh, the call to action before you got up, because I knew you were going to go over. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if anybody has any other questions, I got a, a ton of business cards. I mean, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you, or you could send me an email, whatever. And you know, thank you for what uh, the Lions Club does. How do you get the word out to Katie? Because I have lived in Katie forty something years and knew, did not know anything about you. I have joined every every conceivable chamber of commerce that I know of. Um, you know, we're we're active now with Full Shirt Katie, the Katie Chamber, West I Ten Chamber, the Katie Christian Chamber. Uh, we're getting involved with the, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, but that's a bigger, you know, kind yes. of a citywide. Um, I do you much, advertise in any way? Not, no, we don't. Not really. Um, we are doing um, like pr working on press relationships, okay. and like with the Katie Times and you know, the, right. uh, several of the Katie magazines. Um, I just had a meeting recently with a Hispanic magazine uh, okay. for it's a this city of Houston uh, Hispanic magazine. But uh, for the most part, it's it's I'm working long days and long hours, but okay. but I love it because I mean I really feel like for for a, once a we get it started with the Hispanic community, then they will tell each other. Mm -hmm. So we just need to do that. Like I will tell my maid about it. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, I'll tell her. She has untold number of people that she talks to yeah. every day, and they don't have insurance. I know, and it's, that, that part is pretty wonderful. I mean, because a lot, of, a lot of our population being so heavily Hispanic already, mm -hmm. you know, we have a, a fairly well-known reputation in that right. demographic, but, you know, trying to get employers aware of it that's why i'm really getting the word out to the chambers of commerce and stuff and you do have cards excuse me you have some cards some cards oh yeah okay always because <laughs> my yard man has eight kids <laughs> yeah he doesn't need to he needs his wife needs him to be off <laughs> so i have one question before i um close out this meeting and that is do you have a um a kit that you have you know like a, a you know documentation what have you for uh, whether it's churches or if a business wanted to um, host a clinic, do you have like a oh yeah a, a, a PR yeah, we, kit on what that looks like? Yeah, we we have an entire toolkit for the churches uh, for the satellite locations, uh, so that we can we can give them you know guidance on how to market it, how to promote it, the legal implications, you know what kind of how do you hire from your congregation volunteers? I mean, it's a, it's a full blown toolkit. Is that something I could put on our website? Um, it, it would probably be better to have a contact about that program okay. on your website. But yeah, I mean, we could certainly, we want to partner with you. It's not like we're trying to be secretive. It's just, you know, it's just, it, it would just be make, make a lot more sense to, you know, one of, one of our board members who kind of is leading that program, he was the former chief operating officer for Memorial Harmon Hospital. Mm -hmm. So he and he's he's very big in the in the religious community. So I mean he he knows how to talk the talk and walk the walk and why we're so advantageous to them. Perfect. I just wanted to add one quick thing though. I know you said you're in the rotary, but there's nothing that says you can't be a line and a rotary. I know, I know. <laughs> I, and I and you know it costs less than Netflix. I didn't I didn't say no. I just said not now because you know I just really started <laughs> pulling back all of my operations back into the Katy community so three months ago. Yeah, I'm, I got here. <laughs> thank you. All. Thank you so much. Good to see you. All right, everyone, thank you so much for coming out in person. Jay, you did an amazing job, even though you ran over. I was okay with it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You know, I was like, you know what? I figure we're probably going to run over. It's okay. I can't remember the last time we actually ended a meeting on time, so it's fine. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for, for coming out, Susan, Jay, um, the six of us from the club who showed up in person and braved the torrential Texas-esque weather. Um, and for everyone else who's going to be watching, either uh, who has already watched Tonight Live or who's going to be watching in the next few days, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, if you go to our website, katielions.org, 
Um, there's actually going to be, this recording will be on our website and contact information uh, for both Jay and Susan is going to be on that website as well. So if you need more information about these programs uh, that they mentioned, you can uh, go ahead and just contact them, email, phone number, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and with that, have a great night.